tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The Psychonaut. It was to be the best vacation in history. A gift purchased for his birthday by his closest friends, Tim was ecstatic at the notion of such a new experience. With the small cadre that was his tribe, he had booked his flight, purchased the necessary boots, canteen, and other assorted hiking and camping gear that would be necessary, and had been packed and ready to go for well over a week before they were set to depart. Beyond a mere reprieve from the dull routine of his workaday world, this southern excursion, Tim hoped, would be a life-changing affair. They were bound for Peru, and specifically to the Andes Mountains, where after what he understood would be a somewhat challenging hike through the dense jungle forest and up along the steep slopes of the mountain range, they would arrive at the small retreat. Unlike most tourist traps, however, where massages, spa days, beaches and cool ocean breezes were on offer to help with relaxation, this retreat would be somewhat different for this retreat was meant more for opening the mind than rejuvenating the body. Tim was a DJ and electronic musician by trade. His days were mostly filled with making tracks which he would play at the various parties, bars or clubs he would book, and when not working, Tim could typically be found with either a bong or video game controller in hand, provided he wasn't sleeping the day away. He was what would commonly be referred to as a psychonaut, which was in reality simply a euphemism for one who enthusiastically imbibes hallucinogenic substances, often under the auspices of expanding their consciousness. Though Tim quite often liked to claim that his dalliances with LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, mescaline, then a variety of as of yet unnamed research chemicals, were a matter of broadening his mind, such were in point of fact more recreational than therapeutic, or genuinely experimental. Tim enjoyed taking his mind to new and odd places, and in a given week he was more likely to be found under the influence of something than not. Fortunately for Tim, however, his generally nocturnal schedule and the nature and environment of his work as a rave DJ facilitated this lifestyle well. There was one week remaining until his sojourn to South America, or two gigs and a weekend as he tended to measure time by. The retreat was to be an ayahuasca retreat, whereupon after a hike through the forest and a slight climb up the mountainside, he and his company would be greeted by a shaman and a handful of acolytes who would act as guides for the ceremony to come. Ayahuasca, being possibly the world's most powerful hallucinogen, was one of the few mind-altering substances of such a variety that Tim had yet to indulge in. Where might it take him, he wondered. What might he see? The program through which they were connected with the retreat maintained a rather strict set of preparations for those who wished to participate, which required a minimum of two weeks of abstinent sobriety, a strict diet devoid of refined sugars, processed fats, or caffeine, and a balanced sleep schedule, none of which Tim engaged in, but all of which he promised he would. 
These conditions were rather standard for such retreats, as both from a metabolic and New Age spiritual point of view, cleanses were always expected as part of the preparation for the experience. How would they know if he cheated, though, Tim figured? It couldn't really make that much of an impact. Two days prior to their departure, Tim, along with his best friend Kenny, Kenny's girlfriend Amanda, and the consummate partners in crime, CJ and Dan, sat together at a cafe, going over the final details of their trip. Kenny and Amanda were particularly excited, as this was their first getaway as a couple. CJ and Dan, much like Tim, were mostly excited for the mind-bending adventure which was promised at the top of the mountain. All had their passports ready, their bags packed, and wore their excitement openly on their faces. Of their group, only Kenny and Amanda had taken the dietary and habit requirements seriously, with Kenny only doing so begrudgingly at Amanda's behest. Tim battled a slight hangover while sitting with his friends, as was usual for his appearances in the daylight on days following his gigs, but found such natural. CJ and Dan both greedily slurped down their fruit smoothies as their perpetual cases of the munchies demanded tasty snacks following their fifth or sixth smoke out of the day. So, what do you think it'll be like? Kenny asked. Well, remember when we smoked that DMT last year? That crazy, like, ten-minute trip or whatever? I heard it's pretty much like that, only much longer and, like, turned up to eleven, Tim replied, adjusting his sunglasses and taking a long sip from his coffee. Supposedly, some people get to talk with, like, their ancestors. Others meet aliens or other dimensional beings. It's supposed to be pretty intense. Are you sure you'll be able to make the hike there, Mr. Everything Bagel with cream cheese? Amanda teased, glancing down to the plate which sat before Tim. Tim snickered. I'll be fine. I mean, it's just a walk through the woods and up the hill, right? Besides, if they can't handle me at my worst, they don't deserve me at my best. Not sure that really applies, she responded, joining his chuckle. But hey, don't go crying to me when all the cramps and exhaustion hit you halfway up the mountain. I'm sure he'll make it just fine, Kenny said as he reached across the table, moving to steal a fried chunk of potato from CJ's plate, which he had already abandoned. Amanda, however, quickly slapped the top of his hand, shooing him away from the plate. Same goes for you. We agreed this would be a great opportunity for both of us to cleanse and get into better shape, baby, Amanda said, half chiding, half teasing. It's one pan fry, Kenny protested. That's how it starts, Amanda said, no, fully teasing her boyfriend. Without a word, Kenny withdrew his arm, slouching in defeat. I wonder if there's any way to sneak any home, Dan used. I mean... It's not like the dogs are trained to smell that stuff, right? I don't know, man. I just think I want to risk after seeing moon people from the future or whatever is getting busted by customs, CJ replied, finishing his smoothie. Glancing to Dan, Tim nodded in agreement. Yeah, besides, for all we know, it'll be one of those once is enough things. I heard it can last upwards of five hours. Well, I was reading that it actually opens you up to other planes of existence, other dimensions and stuff. I've been meditating every day, like the instruction said. I really want to have a whole experience with this, you know? Amanda chimed in, a genuine excitement in her voice. Just make sure you don't take any elves back with you, Tim Joe. Elves? Oh, yeah, aren't those those things Joe Rogan was always talking about? Kenny asked. Ah, uh, let's not go down that particular road, Amanda replied. Yeah, DMT elves, he calls them. I have no idea what that's all about, said Tim, taking another bite from his bagel. 
I just hope I see something cool. Like, something to really blow my mind, you know? It's been a while since such a trip impressed me. Maybe you'd have an easier time with it if you weren't always tripping during your gigs. Amanda said, half chiding, half joking. Tim sighed. Yeah, yeah, I know. You know what? After this, I'm gonna... I don't know. What would you call it? Dry out? No Scooby Snacks for two weeks after this. So, you can do two weeks living clean after the treat, but not before? Amanda asked. Well, right now I could go two days, but really, good with that too? Tim replied with a sly smile. I'll be fine. This is going to be absolutely epic. I can't thank you guys enough. Best birthday gift ever. Well, this, this are socks, you know? Dan laughed. Argyle socks, Amanda added with a chuckle. Wait, you're saying I could have gotten old man socks instead? Damn it, guys. Not to be ungrateful, but damn. Argyle socks, Tim replied, attempting to keep from laughing himself. This is going to be amazing, and I am so glad I get to experience it with you guys. Me too. Best gifts on earth are experiences, right? Said CJ. Especially those you get to join in on, added Dan. Ah, uh, is this like that time you got me your favorite scotch for my birthday, Dan? Kenny asked, with a slight smirk. Oh, yeah. We killed that whole bottle. That's good shit, right? Dan replied. It was. So you know I like rum. Ugh. Rum. <laughs> well, now then, Tim. I think this is like that. I'm sure you're okay with it? Dan asked. It was more of a statement than a question. Absolutely. This is going to be fucking epic. Tim replied. A broad smile cracking his face in two. Life-changing. The following days seemed to drag, though only due to the perfectly ordinary time distortion that anticipation creates. When one is dreading something in the near future, time moves at a brisker pace than normal. Inversely, when waiting for something one is looking forward to, time generally could not possibly move slower unless it stopped entirely. However, soon it was time for the friends to rally up and make their way to the airport. Their flight was not for several hours, and as they arrived early as was reasonable. Likewise, spurred on by the airline's insistence that lines could be long so it would be best to arrive well ahead of schedule, they were somewhat annoyed to note that the nighttime traffic of the larger international airport was minimal at best. Ticket agents and TSA all stood around, looking as bored as bored could be. Some joked quietly to one another, others simply stared into their phones. As the group approached the roped-out zigzag pathway typically employed to manage the hundreds of people who would be in line at any given moment, they were collectively annoyed with the needless back and forth they had to walk just to make it to security. After the first few rows, Tim had had enough. Fuck this, he said to himself, as he began bending low the waist to slip beneath one rope after another. Though his path was now a straight line, the bending and ducking proved to be considerably more physically taxing than simply walking would have been. A fact not lost on the bored-looking TSA agent who sat at his booth, watching and trying not to smirk or chuckle. This, likewise, was not lost on Tim, who rather immediately realized it was all purposeful. Hi, Tim said, finally reaching the small black check-in station. Hello, sir, the agent replied. Handing his passport and ticket over to the agent, Tim asked, Be honest with me. You guys keep those ropes set up just for a laugh, right? The agent looked up to them and fought to suppress a smirk. You could have just gone around, sir, the young man replied, gesturing over to his right. 
Alongside the small maze of ropes through which Dan, CJ, Amanda, and Kenny were still zigzagging along through, Jim noticed a straight portion along the edge, at the front of which was posted a sign reading, Express Lane. Ah, Jim replied, now feeling slightly foolish. But, yeah, now I'm keeping those up for a laugh, the agent said, seeing Tim likewise finding the humor in it. Soon the group was checked in. They slipped off their shoes and stepping one by one into the body scanner, were soon cleared and let into the main terminal. Looking to the time and realizing there was still a solid three hours until boarding, CJ and Dan wasted no time in slipping off into a restroom, their pockets stuffed with dryer sheets. Once there, the pair would remove the cardboard tube to the toilet paper in one of the stalls, stuff it with said scented dryer fabric, and take turns blowing weed hits slowly through it, leaving the stall hazy, albeit smelling of sweet summer rain. Amanda and Kenny opted to go for a snack down in the food court, leaving Tim opting to take a solo adventure at the nearest bar. Dan and CJ, while continuing to smoke endless amounts of weed, had taken many of the dietary recommendations the retreat insisted upon more seriously than at least Tim, avoiding excess sugars, fats, caffeine, and, to an extent, alcohol. Their last remaining vice was such they were certain it wouldn't matter. While Amanda kept Kenny in line for the most part, it was ultimately Tim who made no real changes to speak of. Taking a seat at the nearly empty bar, Tim was immediately greeted by the bartender. He was an older man in his later fifties with salt and pepper hair and a strong square build. He was almost cliché in his white shirt, black apron, and the off-white bar rag slung casually over his shoulder. All he needed was a toothpick, and he'd have a hat trick, thought Tim. What can I get you? The bartender asked. Um, hmm, I think I'll go for a, I guess a Jack and Coke? Tim said uncertainly. You sure? Don't sound too excited. Want to try something new? We are kind of a craft cocktail bar, the bartender replied. I guess. What do you recommend? What kind of liquor do you like? I like whiskeys, bourbons, that kind of thing, Tim replied, genuinely curious to see what would come of this. It felt a bit like going into a barber with no idea outside of needing a haircut and leaving it to the artistic and professional judgment of someone who knew what you'd like, just a few sync prompts. Okay, how about a prohibition era cocktail? Kind of thing they drink in speakeasies and the like back in the 20s, the bartender offered. Ooh, like a straight hundred years ago. A century-old drink. Why not? What is it? Called a Bowden. It's bourbon, a bit of honey, a bit of lemon, a bit of... Well, how about this? If you don't like it, you don't buy it. Deal, said Tim, already feeling as though his vacation was working out beautifully, despite having not even taken off yet. The bartender went to work effortlessly mixing the bourbon, honey, lemon juice, and, to Tim's surprise, a dash of hot sauce. Topping with a lemon twist, the drink was something considerably more fancy than Tim was accustomed to. At a first sip, however, he discovered his new favorite cocktail. The tang, the sweetness, that heat of hint. They all blended together seamlessly with each sip becoming a challenge not to follow with a greedy gulp. Tim placed the glass down after his first sip, his eyebrows raised and face conveying the purest look of approval possible. Like it, huh? The bartender asked. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This slaps. I love it. Good. I'm glad. Learned that down in New Orleans. A little place called Twelve Mile Limit. Great spot if you ever make it down there. 
Tim sipped again, trying to restrain himself from gulping the delicious cocktail down in a single go. Yeah, I've always wanted to go down there. Maybe hit Mardi Gras or something, you know? The bartender shrugged. I definitely recommend going, but avoid the big tourist times. Those are pretty much the only times during the year the locals are less than happy to see you. Really? Tim asked. Yeah. Too many cars, traffic. Really, it comes down to a bunch of people who don't get it showing up at once. Don't get it? Tim asked, taking another controlled pull from his glass. It's the New Orleans thing. It's different. You either get it or you don't. Anyway, though, where are you headed, young man? Somewhere exotic and fun, I hope. Ah, um, Peru, actually, Tim replied with a smile. Peru? Yeah, it's a birthday gift from my friends. We're going down for something of a retreat. Gonna hike up into the mountains and enjoy some spirit medicine. Tim looked up to the bartender, curious if he'd understand his subtext. The man thought a moment while shifting a few glasses in the bar sink. After a moment, a smirk crossed his face. Ah, yes, sir. I think I know what you're talking about, he said. Ever tried it yourself? Tim asked. Assuming we're thinking of the same thing, no. Never really played in that area of things if you get my drift. But I had some friends give it a go. No complaints from them. Tim leaned in, suddenly very interested. Really? What'd they say about it? Well, they said it was definitely a life-changing experience. But if I'm going to be honest with you and you're dedicated on going through with it, I'll say it's probably better you go in blind. One of those see what happens kind of things. Tim thought a moment about this. Part of him naturally wanted to know what he was headed for. Yet at the same time, the notion of embarking on something as intense and potentially profound as this, without the faintest idea as to what to expect, appealed to him. This was, after all, the nature of the psychomote. With so few remaining undiscovered countries outside of the deep space of the depths of the ocean available to ordinary people, perhaps exploring whatever altered state he was headed for on its own grounds with no expectations might enhance things. Tim raised his glass. Cheers to that, he said, raising it again and then sipping heartily on it until it was all but gone. Shall I get you another, sir? The bartender asked. Absolutely. And call me Tim. Nice to meet you, Tim. I'm Walt, the bartender replied, as he set to immediate work fixing Tim another bowden. This one would be a little stronger than the last. After all, Tim had a long flight ahead of him. As he sauntered to the gate, somewhat buzzed from the trio of progressively stiffer bourbon cocktails, Tim found his quartet of friends waiting together. CJ and Dan were notably relaxed, and their bleary eyes were slow to meet Tim's as he approached. Both chuckled the sort of aimless laughter of the stoned as he sat down. You know, I used to joke that during the whole COVID thing, they were just training us to get used to paying airport prices for lukewarm food with the whole DoorDash thing. I was wrong. They were training us to get used to paying double that much for slightly warmer food at the airport. Kenny commented as his friend took a seat. I take it dinner wasn't a hit? He asked. They certainly don't know how to cook his steak, Kenny said indignantly. Kenny's mad because he still doesn't get that restaurants like these can't serve rare steak, Amanda elaborated. A problem he wouldn't have to deal with if he just gave up eating meat. The latter, she said, with an obvious passive aggression. Amanda was a vegan, though you hardly know it, as she was of the rare sort who didn't make a big deal of it. 
This, however, did not stop her from at least trying to passively persuade her boyfriend that he would be considerably healthier and happier if he did the same. In secret, though, Amanda would, from time to time, sneak a small chocolate milkshake, a favorite treat of her since childhood, passing off the subsequent indigestion as womanly problems, so as not to blow her cover. I think for, what, 28 bucks before tax, they could at least not cook it so much. Yet somehow, it was still almost cold when I got it, Kenny continued to protest. Well, I'm sure they can give you raw meat in Peru, Amanda replied. Actually, Tim offered, do you know what the national dish is? Ceviche. Raw fish. Like sushi? A stoned and bleary Dan asked, his ears perked up at the mention of delicious food. Kinda. They cure it in lemon or lime juice and serve it with greens and other stuff, Tim explained. His own mouth beginning to salivate at the thought of such. How do you know so much about Peruvian food? The man asked, amused. Tim could typically be relied upon to fully explain the workings of musical arrangements, equipments, computers, and the encyclopedic history of Lord of the Rings. Yet a worldly foodie he was not. I figured I should learn a bit about the place, said Tim. We've got two free days bookending the retreat. Last thing I want is to end up doing is going to a damn subway or something. I always hate when I see that. People travel the far off and end up eating at a pizza hut. Do you know there's a pizza hut right next to the Great Pyramids in Egypt? You never see it in the photos, but just turn to the side and there's a fucking pizza hut. It's like marking a little space on the floor next to the Mona Lisa for selfies. I'm pretty sure they have that, CJ said, idly sipping on an iced tea. Tim replied, slightly defeated at the concept. Dan chuckled. <laughs> Put an e-bike lane on that Great Wall of China. The group shared a laugh. They better have Wi-Fi at Machu Picchu, or I just cannot even, Amanda added, each word dripping with sarcastic vapidity. I hope they made Gettysburg a gun-free zone, Tim offered. Give me a commemorative Fitbit for the Trail of Tears gift shop, said Kenny, not expecting the reaction which followed. Whoa, hey, the group almost said in unison. It was a regular part of the game, not even waiting to see who took it too far, but rather waiting for Kenny to inevitably do so. Pump the brakes there, Andrew Jackson, said Amanda. Easy on it, General Custer, added Tim. Slow your roll, Cortez, blurted CJ. The other four turned bewildered looks to him. What? Here's a conquistador. Eh, Tim replied, as the other three nodded. Whatever, said CJ. When are we boarding, anyway? Just as he asked this, the familiar ding of the PA system drew their attention before the terminal agent began to speak. We would now like to welcome all first class as well as all diamond and platinum member passengers to board flight 881 to Lima, Peru. Please have your boarding passes ready. Again, we are now boarding all first class diamond and platinum member passengers for flight 881 to Lima, Peru. And that is us, Tim said excitedly to his friends as the group picked up their carry-on luggage and made their way to the gate. Tim had never flown first class before and was rather excited to finally give it a try. He had, on the few times he'd flown commercially, always felt a slight pang of envy as he'd passed the cushy, broad seats with their soft lighting and unfathomable legroom on his way to economy class. This time, however, he felt like a VIP, sliding into cloud-like armchairs that awaited him. The bourbon had begun to make him sleepy. And between the late night departure and sheer comfort of his seat, he barely made it until they were in the air before falling into a deep and dreamless sleep. They had some ten hours in the air yet to go, through which Tim and all of his friends, save for Dan, would 
be in and out of consciousness throughout the trip, would sleep like babies. For Tim, no sooner had he closed his weary eyes at home than did he awake, refreshed and alive just prior to landing. It was late morning when the flight touched down at Jorge Chavez International Airport in Lima. The sun shone brightly down on the tarmac as the plane jostled slightly upon making contact with the ground. Soon they had taxied to the gate, enjoying the final peak of first-class flying. Tim was the first to step off the plane. Joining with his friends, the group made their way down the concourse and then on through customs. As they passed through, their passports stamped. It was a still slightly sleepy Dan who chuckled when declaring the purpose of their visit as pleasure. This elicited a momentary, spurious look from the customs agent, who raised an unimpressed eyebrow at the young man before stamping his documents and moving him along. Soon they had picked up their luggage, hailed a cab in the form of a passenger van, and set off to the address of their Airbnb. Amanda attempted speaking in the broken but functional Spanish she possessed, with this lasting only until the driver replied in English. He was a cheery enough fellow, offering the group bottled water and asking where in the States they hailed from. Oh, yes, very nice place, very nice, the driver replied. It was his standard reply whenever a foreigner said where they were from. He'd never been more than a hundred miles from Lima, where he had been born, yet that never stopped him from telling his fares how much he enjoyed his time in their lands of origin. After a short and pleasant drive, they arrived at the hacienda they would call home base for the next several days. It was a beautiful two-story home, replete with a pool in its courtyard. Though one of the pricier offerings on the website, the exchange rate between US dollars and Peruvian Seoul made the luxury option too good for Kenny or Amanda to pass up while putting the trip together. Within no time, they had each selected their desired bedrooms and had gotten to unpacking. The plan was to settle in for an hour or so, then to explore the local flavor. Naturally, Amanda, who viewed preparation for adventure as half the fun, had identified several local spots to take in the art, music, and cuisine. Over dinner, Dan had made a point to order ceviche, and upon his obligatory line about adding soy sauce and calling it su ceviche, enduring a mix of chuckles and groans from his friends, had decided that night such was his new favorite stoner food. The night was a lovely evening of fine food and bad jokes. Soon each retired to their respective rooms, relatively early by Tim's nocturnal standards, all in preparation of the following day's trials and rewards. The next morning, the five of them arose and enjoyed a light breakfast before being met outside of a local cafe by a large white van that was chartered to take them to the beginning of their hike. The retreat itself promised plenty of hikes and nature walks, however, to reach the retreat itself required several hours of intermediate hiking up a slope which at times could prove a bit steep for those without ideal balance. Dan and Tim seemed to suffer these stumbles most among their party of what was now nine, with the addition of four other touristy seekers. Between Dan's sleepy lethargy, which persisted now as a matter of him oversleeping rather than being sleep-deprived, and what wrought from Tim's general sedentary lifestyle outside of work, the two quickly fell to the back of the pack, with their guide consistently cheering them on as they climbed. After what to those two felt like an eternity, and to the fitness-focused Kenny and Amanda, a brief stroll in the woods, the party arrived at a flat clearing along the mountainside. Upon it sat several small cabins and a pair of central bungalows. Dotted around the property, a series of fire pits sat either burning or smoldering. As they approached, the group was met by a small man in an elaborate hat, wearing a colorful weaved set of silk-laden linens. He bore a broad and warm smile as he reached out to greet each person individually, shaking their hands and welcoming them to the retreat. 
For the life of him, no matter how many times he heard the name repeated, Tim could never commit the correct pronunciation to memory. Hello, the shaman said, clasping Tim's hands together. Welcome to Refugio Tranquilo. It is, the shaman trailed off, momentarily as his eyes locked with Tim's. Um, lo siento. It is a pleasure to have you join us. The older man's gaze lingered on Tim a moment, with a slight hint of curiosity before moving on to Dan, who stood beside him, and offering the same greeting. As he made his way down the line of Tim's friends, Tim could have sworn he caught the old shaman, sparing at least one sideways glance to him before returning to his duties. Chalking it up to exhaustion and perhaps latent egotism, Tim disregarded this oddity and returned to silently wishing he'd be led to a place to drop his gear and have a rest. Though the more athletic companions he had arrived with and been joined by seemed rejuvenated by the upward walk through the jungle, Tim felt his knees and ankles ache mercilessly. At last, the words he had been waiting for were announced to the group. Please head on inside to the main building where you might rest and take some water, the shaman announced as each of the travelers plucked up their dropped backpacks and gear and proceeded in single file lines into the larger of the two central bungalows. They were simple structures, much akin to those found at American campgrounds, with basic brown wooden frames and bug screens covering the open windows which lined the structure from end to end. Within the larger bungalow, rows of simple, single-sized mattresses lined the floor, made up with soft white linens, and each with a single pillow at their end. The place simply radiated serenity and calm, and even despite Tim and Dan's respective fatigue from the hike, they were clearly ill-prepared for. Even they found the very experience of being here quite relaxing. Please, feel free to select a cabin as you'd like. A young American woman who served as an aide to the shaman said, greeting the group as they entered. Take your time to explore the grounds. We have fresh fruit, water, and tea available in the other main lodge if you would like. Once you've settled in, we will have lunch prepared, after which we will have some activities planned, including a meditation session, yoga, and a short hike to what I'm sure you'll agree is one of the most beautiful views in the world. My name is Orchid. I'm one of the guides. Feel free to ask should you need anything or have any questions. She was a bubbly sort, standing around five feet even. Her dirty blonde hair was clumped in places in what were clear attempts at dreadlocks. Exuding the sort of crunchy, hippie personality one might expect at a spiritualist retreat, her presence consistently was accompanied by the scent of numerous body oils and an unfortunate level of body odor. She moved in to hug each of them individually, starting with Amanda. The group collectively thanked her, and then dispersed to claim their respective cabins. Kenny and Amanda naturally bunked together, as did CJ and Dan, leaving Tim happily solo in a private cabin. The cabins, if you could even call them such, were little more than single wooden rooms, with screened windows wrapping around each, with propped and collapsible awnings for when the occupants may desire some privacy. Within each cabin room were two single beds, each with a small table beside them, upon which sat a bowl, a cup, and a bottle of water. Dropping his pack and other gear, Tim first sat and then laid down upon the mattress, finding it surprisingly softer than he'd expected. Sighing deeply as he relaxed into the cot, he closed his eyes and listened to the sound of the forest around him. It was indeed quite serene, and had it not been for the muttered chatter of the others, Tim may have fallen entirely to sleep. Instead, after fighting off the urge to doze, Tim rose and rejoined the rest. As he climbed out of the bed, the knob of his wristwatch, a watch his father had given him years ago, caught on the loose linen sheet. 
After a moment's struggle with a single piece of thread, Tim shrugged and took the watch off, placing it on the small bedside table. He wouldn't need it, given the itinerary. The remainder of the day was spent hiking, meditating, chatting with the others in attendance, and generally milling about. It was clear that, like Tim, the majority of those on site were more or less just waiting for the real magic hours, which they were informed would take place just dusk. Hours passed. The group saw gorgeous sights along their first guided walkabout, even spotting a jaguar on the hunt just off the trail. Lunch was served and was a flavorful medley of greens, local fruits and nuts. Over the meal, Dan lamented that it wasn't the same ceviche they had enjoyed the day prior. He seemed quite taken with the dish. After lunch, there was more quiet fraternization, meditation. A few people took naps. Soon the time had come for the big event, the ceremony itself. As the shaman tended to the large pot in which the special brew tea steeped, the travelers, seekers, and attendees filed into the larger meeting hall bungalow, taking seats along the rows of mats upon the floor. There was something of a quiet yet excited murmur and energy which seemed to fill the room. Glancing to his left, Tim watched as Kenny and Amanda chittered quietly between each other, both clearly very excited. Have you ever done this before? A man's voice from his right asked. Turning, Tim saw beside him sat a young man somewhere in his mid-twenties, small of frame and with chin-length brown hair. Tim, for some reason, thought the man looked like a bass player. Um, no, first time, he replied. Oh, you're in for a treat, said the man. I take it you've done this before? Yeah, this will be my third time, the man replied excitedly. What's it like? Tim asked, watching as the shaman began to distribute small bowls of the magic tea down at the other end of the room. Hard to describe, really. Usually a bit different for everyone. Let's just say if there are unresolved parts of your mind or past or whatever, don't be surprised if you don't sort them out. The man replied with a sly smile. Tim was unsure what to make of his statement, but was further confused by his follow-up. Oh, watch out for the elves. They're always an interesting interaction, added the man. Elves? Tim began to reply, but stopped as the shaman appeared before him, handing him a small wooden bowl about the size of a coffee cup. Within it, sat an oily and honestly foul-smelling liquid. Swirling it around gently in his cup, Tim noted as its thick, viscous consistency clung to the sides like a wine made from used motor oil. After taking his own cup, the stranger beside Tim leaned in closer, speaking in a hushed tone. Don't sip it. Just pound it down. Ignore the flavor as much as you can and try your best to keep it down. Thanks, Tim replied, still looking down into the cup. From the center of the room, the shaman spoke some rites, which Tim missed entirely. And with a nod, the group partook in their teas. Tim hesitated a moment, smelling the acrid stench of the brew. However it was made, scent and flavor were clearly not a priority. Shrugging to himself, Tim took a deep breath, counted to three in his head, and as quickly as he could, threw back the bitter brew. No sooner had it hit his tongue than did he feel a sudden need to retch. But mentally buckling down and reminding himself that vomiting is as much mental as it is physical, forced down the final sips. His face contorted in disgust, and his chin sank back into his neck as every conceivable expression of foul displeasure crossed were put on display. He wasn't alone. Nearly every other attendee likewise recoiled at the scent and flavor of the thick and bitterly earthy tea. 
Amanda had tears in her eyes as she struggled to keep hers down, and Dan nearly immediately began dry heaving. As the group suffered the taste, the shaman and his assistant, Orchid, went around the room with wooden plates, upon which sat orange slices, bits of ginger, and small cups of honey. As Tim's nose remained filled with a pungent aroma, he wished for nothing more than to blow the scent away. Seeing his struggle, Orchid approached him with a small bowl of coffee beans. Here, smell these. It should help, she said with a smile. Tim inhaled the scent of the beans greedily, feeling a slight sense of olfactory relief as the dread stench of the tea was softened in his nose. Thanks. This is... Oof. This is something else. You get used to it. Or you don't. I barely notice anymore. But I don't think you'll meet a person alive who can say they enjoy the flavor, she responded holding the bowl of beans off to another suffering seeker. I don't imagine so. So, now what? Tim asked as Orchid took his cup from him. Now? She said with a smile. Now? Just give it a little. Maybe take a walk around or go sit by the fire. Looking past the girl and out through the screened-in window, Tim saw a flickering campfire burning just off from the side of the door of the structure. He felt nothing yet, short of the continued revulsion of the taste and waves of nausea as his body continued regarding the tea as unwelcome. Moving carefully, so as not to further upset his stomach or digestive tract, Tim rose and began off with the fire. Taking his seat near enough to enjoy it, he settled in and waited for the brew to kick in. He wondered how it would compare to his other hallucinogenic experiences. Would there be a sense of mild high before the weirdness began, as with Mushroom? Or perhaps, would he just start slowly picking up on how odd things were becoming, as with LSD? Excited though he was, it would have been a lie to claim there wasn't an element of nervousness behind it all. Excited nerves, but nerves all the same. Minutes passed. His friends joined him by the fire, all exuding the same excitement and curiosity as Tim. Idle conversations began and ended. Dan's face in particular remained slightly contorted, as if the still bitter fountains taunted his tongue and sciences. The minutes continued on. Soon leading to first to a half hour elapsing, then an hour, all with nothing happening. I don't know. Then, just a hair over seventy minutes since Tim had first sat down by the fire, he felt something odd within his mind. He couldn't quite describe it, if pressed, but whatever it was, it was gaining power and volume. Then, everything went black. Tim woke up in his cabin. He had no recollection of how or when, but he had clearly made it back to bed at some point. Looking around, he realized quite quickly that he was alone, as he had planned for taking a solo cabin as he had. Looking out the window, he saw the night sky was still above and blazoned with millions upon millions of stars visible only in those remote places free from urban light pollution. Though very beautiful, they were also quite real, with no visible hints of being a hallucination. In point of fact, beyond not feeling as though he were any form of high or tripping, Tim felt remarkably awakened and refreshed, as though he had slept his deepest sleep ever. Looking at his watch, he saw that some six hours had indeed passed since the ceremony had taken place, and yet despite his best efforts, he could recall nothing from the experience afterwards. Not even in the manner of a blackout, but rather there existed, it felt, a void in his recent memory. As though he'd ceased to be altogether until waking on his cot. The sensation was actually curiously familiar, reminding him of the one time he'd undergone surgery and was put under general anesthesia. The deep and dreamless sleep of such going beyond mere sleep, 
and serving almost like an off button for his conscious mind. He honestly felt a bit cheated, as all the talk of mind-blowing sights and experiences, philosophical and personal growth, these supposed elves he was supposed to watch out for, none of it had happened for him. Instead, he recalled sitting by a fire comfortably, and then simply waking up. Tim rose from his cot and stood up with a stretch. Checking the watch, which sat beside the bed, he noted some considerable amount of time had passed, and no stranger to blackouts. Was grateful someone had seen to it, he was deposited on his cot. Stepping outside, he noticed the fire had died, and everyone else seemed to have likewise gone to bed. All but Orchid, who Tim spied smoking a joint some twenty yards away along the back side of the main structure. He approached her. Hey there, how are you feeling? She asked, noticing his approach. Um, fine, I'm fine, he said hesitantly. How was it? Uh, well, to be honest, it wasn't. It wasn't? Orchid asked, a confused look in her eye. Yeah, it was like I just blacked out or something. One minute I'm sitting in front of the fire, and the next I'm waking up on my cot, and six hours have gone by. Orchid held the joint aloft, offering it to Tim, shrugged and accepted. That's really weird. I've never heard of anyone having that happen. Huh. The night was dark. Darker than it had been previously. Where before the sky was an incandescent marvel of cosmic artistry, now only but a few stars shone or twinkled in the inky black above. Tim was a tad let down by this, as the naked night sky so far from the light pollution of cities had by far been one of the most beautiful sights he had ever beheld. It's dark tonight, huh? He said, passing the joint back to Orchid. No darker than usual, I guess, Orchid said with a shrug. So, when do y'all leave? Flying out the day after tomorrow. We'll be heading back into town tomorrow and then taking off the next morning, Tim replied. As he took the lit and smoldering joint from her once more, she shot him a sly look with her eyes. Well... Seeing as you got your rest, I imagine you probably won't be sleeping much tonight, yeah? The immediate subtext was lost for a moment on Tim as the weed began to take effect. Yeah, he said. Probably screwed up my sleep schedule in general. The orchid leaned in closer. Maybe you'd like some... company? She stated more than asked. It took a moment for Tim to notice the way she was looking at him and for the requisite pair of twos to equal four in his mind. Oh. Well, yeah. Company. Company would be lovely, he replied, his face splitting into a broad grin. Orchid leaned in and kissed him deeply. He returned in kind. After a few moments more, the two rose from their seats, kissed again, and made their way back towards Tim's cabin. He would sleep, and sleep well that night, but not before Orchid sapped him of every ounce of energy he had, the two ultimately collapsing in a sweaty pile of flesh and hyperventilation. Morning came too soon, in his opinion, upon waking. Upon waking, he was surprised to see that Orchid was gone, and he was alone again in the cabin. Fishing around for his watch, he was surprised to see that it was already nearly eleven in the morning. That would give him just enough time to grab some breakfast before packing and heading off. He hoped he might bump into her in the main hall, but she was nowhere to be found, most likely off tending to some errands, he reasoned. After breakfast, which was comprised almost entirely of fruit, he met with his company again, sat by the small fire pit, 
which now sat black and dormant. The sun shone down from a brilliant clear blue sky, and the day was proving to be a beautiful one. The four friends were all regaling one another with stories of their extraordinary experiences, with CJ in particular seeming to positively burst with excitement. They each had their packs nearby, though none seemed to be in any hurry to go anywhere. Morning, sleepyhead, Amanda teased. We were beginning to wonder if we should wake you. You sleep well? Yeah, I'd say so, Tim said as a knowing smirk half crossed his face. So, we getting ready to go? I just have to throw a few of my things together and say goodbye to work it real quick. Who? She asked. Orchid, the girl who works here. Little blonde hippie chick? Tim said, seeing that none of this was registering with Amanda at all. Gave us all hugs when we got here. Was hoping to say goodbye before we left. Amanda merely shrugged and shook her head before her intuition kicked in and her face split into a grin. Oh shit, you got lucky last night, didn't you? Tim said nothing, but found his vain attempts to suppress his smile saying enough. Oh, you did! Oh, happy birthday, Timmy! Amanda chuckled. No shit, you fly over 3,000 miles and climb a mountain and you get to have a spirit quest and then sleep with a local? My man! Dan said, rising from his seat to offer a congratulatory high five. I don't think she's local. Pretty sure she's American. But she works here. You all met her, Tim insisted. Yet the group simply looked at him with a mix of slight confusion and mirthful teasing. Whatever, man. Important thing is you had yourself a proper goddamn adventure. I'm glad we could all be here with you for it, said Kenny. We should get going, though place we're staying at as a curfew, if you can believe that. Right on, replied Tim. Just need to grab my stuff. Be right back. Tim returned to his cabin, hoping in the back of his mind that he might find an orchid there, but alas, it was merely he, his effects, and the rustic little bed and nightstand now sat awaiting their next seeker and guest. As he pulled the last of his belongings together, Zipping them up into his backpack, he turned to the nightstand to retrieve his watch, only to find it missing. Searching behind, below, and all around the little table, he soon lifted the mattress, and then the entire bed frame in search of the watch, but found it nowhere. Had Orkin taken it while he slept? That he ruled out as impossible, as he remembered checking the time before going to breakfast. Had someone snuck into his cabin and stolen it? That made little sense, as it was not a particularly fine watch, and among the items in his luggage, plenty of more expensive or desirable loot could be found, none of which was missing. It made no sense, and for ten solid minutes he effectively tore the room and his bag and his pockets apart in search of it. It wasn't until Kenny's voice shouted to him from out in front of the cabin that he was stirred from his hunt. Tim, you good to go? Kenny beckoned through the screen window. Uh, yeah, one sec. Just, just trying to find my watch. Tim hollered back. Your watch? Okay, whatever. Just uh, meet us at the fire pit when you're ready. We should really get moving if we want a chance to get dinner before turning in. Kenny replied. Tim continued searching through every square inch of the small square room, checking and rechecking and re-rechecking his bags, every conceivable pocket or lining, the sheets upon the bed, and even the bed itself. And yet, for all his trouble, he found nothing. After a few more minutes of searching, Kenny appeared in the doorway, urging him once more to get moving. Dude, Kenny said. We really need to go, like now. 
If not, we might end up hiking in the dark, and I don't think any of us are up to that particular challenge. Sorry, it's just my watch. It's the one my dad gave me, and I don't want to lose it. Your dad? Kenny was slightly, though obviously rather confused. Well, listen, if you've looked through and through this spot, maybe just ask the guru shaman guy if he can keep an eye out for it. I have it shipped to you later. We need to get moving. Tim sighed a sigh of resignation. I guess you're right. I'm gonna grab my stuff, chat with the shaman guy, and maybe Orchid if I can find her. And I'll be right with you guys. Kenny nodded, equal parts confused yet in a hurry. Tim knew he was right, and that regardless of if he found the missing property or not, they needed to get moving, lest they run out of daylight and deny themselves a final meal before departure. Approaching the old shaman who led them in the ceremony, the man cheerfully admitted he knew nothing of the watch or where Orchid was, the latter seeming to confuse him more than the former, but promised that should he find Tim's missing watch, he would be sure to ship it to him using the address Tim made a point to leave with him. Soon his bags were packed, and his friends were back on the trail, headed down from the mountain and into town. As they walked, Tim listened to his company speak of their experiences while under the influence of the tea. Part of him felt cheated, as he had no stories to tell, nor lessons to ponder, but just rather the absence of memory, with but a faint recollection from the furthest reaches of his mind of a silent and motionless void. An ocean of absence, easily described as endless blackness, but still incorrect, in such as blackness is a thing, whereas this odd recollection was pure nothingness. His four friends were surprised to hear him retell this, each with their own intense and profound experiences to expound upon, and he, having nothing but a long sleep with the added benefit of a hookup. Curiously, none of them could remember Orchid at all, despite Tim's rather detailed description of her. It was as they were just nearing the end of the trail, closing in on the small, pull-off space where a van sat waiting to take them back to town that Kenny asked an odd question. So, Tim, I wanted to ask you, when did you get that watch you were looking for? My watch? My dad gave it to me years ago for my birthday. I told him I didn't need one since my phone has a clock, but he told me that every man needs three things to round out a wardrobe. A good suit, shine shoes, and a sharp watch. Still far from having the other two, Tim replied with a chuckle. It's just weird, like, you've never really talked about your dad as well. I don't think I ever even noticed you at a watch, Kenny said, a curious eyebrow raised. Wait, what? What, what? What do you mean I've never really talked about my dad? Kenny, you've met him. I have? Kenny asked, looking utterly baffled. Yeah, at least two or three times. You don't remember? I had a cookout and he brought an entire rack of lamb with him. You couldn't get enough of it. Kenny pondered this, scraping through his memories as best as he could. I remember the lamb, but not... That's weird. Well, at any rate, I hope they find your watch. Yeah, me too, Tim replied. He didn't think to explore the matter further, as they still had some walking to do. But he was at a complete loss as to how his best friend of many years could forget meeting his dad. However, these thoughts were quickly overlooked as soon the party reached the waiting passenger van and climbed in. As the van took off, headed back towards town, the fading light of the evening sun waned as it dipped further and further into the horizon. Hues of pinks gave way to blues and purple, which quickly gave way to black. It was another dark night, 
without many if any visible stars in the sky. An unfortunate result of the light pollution coming off of the city as they approached him reasoned. Soon they were back in civilization and checking into their temporary accommodations. Once their bags and belongings were safely tucked into the small bungalow house they'd rented, they'd headed out together downtown in search of dinner. CJ and Dan both thought one last night of drinks and libations might be a good way to round out the trip, but Kenny and Amanda wanted for a little more after eating than to retire for the evening so as to be up bright and early and ready for their flight. They checked with Tim to see if he was down, but he opted instead to take a solo stroll around town before retiring for the night himself. So it was the five friends went their separate ways. The night was cool, relatively speaking, and the skies as clear as the glaring lights of the urban oasis around them would allow for. Lima, as a city, smelled curiously like any other big city, with its mixes of garbage and human waste, diesel and car fumes, and of course the smells of fresh fish and cooked seafood. Tim strolled block after block pondering his experience thus far, until finding himself in an unusually quiet part of town. He had been so consumed in thought he had failed to recognize that he had wandered well away from the touristy hotel and nightlife area, and well into a very pastel, very residential one. He smelled the air yet again, this time smelling competing wafts of home-cooked meals and a curious floral scent that seemed to hedge every other fragrance. So consumed was he with this strange olfactory experience that he'd entirely failed to notice the two men with bandanas around their faces approached from behind, each with blades in hand. Lima, like most large cities, is no stranger to crime and for a clueless American traveler such as he to wander idly into a random part of town in the dead of night like this was universally an invitation for either trouble or a most amazing experience. Sadly, in this instance, it was the former which had found him. Dame Toro! A voice barked from behind him. Toro ahora! Tim raised his hands in compliance to either side of his head. Yet curiously, just as he turned to face his assailants and naturally to comply with their orders, which he reasoned had to be some variation of give me your shit, was surprised to see the sidewalk behind him empty. It had happened too quickly for him to see, but in a split second, the two bandits who had sought to rob him of the whopping next to nothing he carried suddenly ceased to be. In one moment, they were there for any who might be looking to see and the next. Before Tim could turn to lay eyes upon them, they were gone. Tim glanced around, genuinely baffled and wondering for a split second if this was not some kind of prank. But despite his best efforts, no bandits of the like could be found. It was then that he decided that perhaps it might be a good idea to head back, get some sleep, and get ready for the following day's departure. If he was really lucky, perhaps Kenny and Amanda might have finished their coital embraces, allowing for an easy sleep. In either case, he knew it was time to go. The walk back to the house was uneventful. Tim repeatedly sought to check the time on his wrist, but each time was presented with the sad reminder that the watch was lost. It had been such a standard piece upon his person, so much so that he was even used to seeing the tan lines and sometimes indents upon his skin from his regular wearing of it. However, now his wrist felt empty, light, and strangely enough possessed neither the long-term indents nor discolorations he had expected, as though it had never existed at all. Another sigh escaped him on the third or fourth time checking the phantom timepiece. Instead of pulling out his phone, he saw that he was well within curfew still, and so continued a winding route of half-memory and half-periodic checking his GPS until finally he arrived. 
Slipping into the darkened Airbnb, he crept to the room he was set to share with CJ and Dan, only to find it thankfully uninhabited. Climbing into his own bed, he hoped silently that neither of his roommates this night would wake him just before falling asleep again. He slept a deep and dreamless sleep. It was as though he were touching the void once again. The next morning, Tim arose. He shambled into the kitchen, set the coffee maker to fill a pot, and then shambled again into the bathroom for a shower, following a solid morning constitutional. His bowels seemed still to be upset over the odd concoctions he had been ingesting recently, and to him at that point ordinary bowel movements were but a bitter memory. Once done, he made his way back into the kitchen, poured a cup of coffee, and got to packing. CJ and Dan spilled in through the front door. The poster children were hungover and sleep-deprived, and drank greedily from the coffee pot Tim had prepared. They, too, soon packed in the most haphazard and slobby manner imaginable, before being joined by Kenny and Amanda. The whole crew was there, some hungover, some sleep-deprived due to wanting to get every available grind, bump, and thrust in a foreign country out as possible, and in Tim's case... A simple bewilderment at how far from what he'd expected this trip had come to be. Before long, all were packed, fed, or at least caffeinated, and all were then piling into the Uber minivan they had ordered, which arrived a surprising five minutes early. From there, it was back to the airport, followed by a quick and comparatively easy glide through airport security. Lunch was taken at the food court with the group seeking whatever local cuisine they could between their ever-present and ever-tasteless McDonald's and Sabaros. And then soon, it was time to board. As they boarded, Tim was wholly surprised when a flight attendant asked him if he would like an upgrade to first class, as several seats that had been sold remained vacant, and at the urging of his friends, he happily accepted the impromptu upgrade. Pulling his phone out just before takeoff, Tim was supremely irritated to see that for some reason his phone had failed to load over half of his contacts, which irked him further as he'd hoped to call the club manager he was booked with to confirm his next gig. The two went back a ways, but inexplicably only a few of his contacts populated as he cursed the phone and service before turning it off and slipping it into his pocket. During the flight, after a few complimentary drinks, Tim passed out. With nearly seven hours to go, his sleep was once again deep and dreamless. There was a comfort there that he had the wits or wherewithal to recognize in his sleeping state. He would most certainly describe his zen. However, as he drifted in that void, right up until the wheels of the plane made their thudding and screeching contact with the pavement, that he had even half a mind to think on such things. Waking up with a jostle, his mind struggled to hold onto that sense of absence and nothingness, as one might an extraordinary dream. Yet soon the bright light of reality took hold, and he was asked to leave his seatbelt on until the plane had come to a full stop at the terminal. After another five or so minutes, the plane had completed its taxi and the slow shuffle of disembarking began. Normally, the single file slog of deplaning, with all of the first class senior citizens taking their sweet time, was something of a bore and a chore to Tim. But this time, for some reason, he found himself exceptionally tired, wanting nothing more than to get home to his apartment have a long, hot shower, and then stretch out in bed. As any traveler knows, economy-class airline sleep is far from fulfilling slumber. Yet first class will always keep you sleepy. Shambling off of the plane, he rubbed his eyes as he looked over his shoulders for his comrades. Amanda was already nose-deep in her phone, ordering an Uber. CJ lagged behind some half-dozen other passengers, his own face an avatar of exhaustion. 
Neither Dan nor Kenny seemed to be among them. However, Tim barely had the energy or presence of mind to question it. The assembled airline patrons then shuffled to the baggage claim after some long walks down long terminal corridors. Amanda and CJ both walked bedraggled beside Tim. For reasons he couldn't be bothered to work out, Dan and Kenny must have gone their own separate way. As they walked, he managed to mutter the words, I think I just want to get home, shower off, and go to bed. The others nodded and grunted in agreement. He was sure they would take necessary care of the other two, who, knowing Kenny and knowing Dan as well as he did, likely had enough spring in their step to have made it to baggage claim, collected their luggage, and booked rides home without even batting an eye. However, when they arrived at baggage claim, still burned out and half asleep, neither of their friends was to be found. Nor did their absence seem to bother his remaining companions. The buzzer rang and a red light began to flash upon the baggage claim conveyor belt. Within a few minutes, Tim's luggage popped out, well before that of his friends. He had taken that time to summon an Uber, which would be arriving momentarily much to his relief, and decided to bid his friends goodbye. Well, that was fun. Thank you all so much, he began. Amanda smiled broadly and stepped towards him, hugging him close. Aww, it was our pleasure. Happy birthday, Timmy. Know that you're friends. We love you, she said. Love you guys, too. Let Kenny and Dan know I said thanks, Tim replied. Amanda looked briefly to the exhausted CJ before looking back to Tim with an awkward smile. Okay, she said. I'll let them know. You get some sleep. You look like you're about to keel over. Let's just grab some lunch tomorrow or something. And so with a smile, Tim bid Amanda and CJ farewell, and finding his Uber conveniently parked just outside the gate, loaded his bag into the trunk, slipped into the back seat, and promptly fell back asleep. As the silent electric compact car carved its way along the streets towards Tim's apartment building, the slight jostles and shifts of an average drive did little to wake him as he lingered once more in a dreamless sleep. It wasn't until they'd arrived back at his place and the driver spoke that Tim awoke and from there collected his things, shambled up the stairs to his front door. He quickly unlocked it, slipped inside, dropped his things and collapsing happily on his bed, proceeded to return to sleep. His sleep this time, however, was not dreamless. Not entirely. Though the quiet and still inky expanse of nothingness still held him suspended in the void, something else was with him. Something just as dark, if not darker than the absence of light or stimuli around him and something he could feel was distinctly not of his mind. It was an alien presence, something strange and unfamiliar. In a fashion, it seemed, or rather felt, to Tim, that it was itself a part of the same nothing which surrounded him. An intelligence, or personality, or at the very least a perspective, that in part seemed to embody the darkness itself. It smiled, if what he saw could be called a smile. It was a dastardly and terrifying implication of a grin. The notion of long, sharp teeth just sort of floating in the nether, rather than the sight of them, rattled Tim to his core. It was akin to the feeling of being watched, yet not finding the source. It was then the presence spoke to him. Or, more accurately, its implied words filled his mind. I cannot thank you enough. It's been so, so long, the presence said wordlessly. Tim attempted to respond somehow, but found himself as formless as his company, and without the ability to even form coherent words. All was merely sense and implication, all of which 
filled him with a type of dread he had never experienced before. He felt a threat here. Something malicious and beyond his ability to either confront or understand. He attempted first to flee, but then realizing he was asleep and dreaming, attempted to force himself awake. All in vain. Suddenly, though he himself was formless in the empty dream space he presently inhabited, he began to feel a strange sensation. It was as if he were a ball of yarn being unraveled slowly. The sense of form and even cohesive self-awareness that kept him tethered to reality itself seemed to be coming undone. He mentally fought back as best as he could, engaged it, felt in some sort of psychic battle with the omnipresent enemy whose very presence felt like the definition of alien malevolence. Whatever it was, he could tell was not of this world. Yet for some strange reason, despite the fear and antipathy he felt towards it, it at the same time felt oddly familiar, as though he'd known it for some time before this nightmare befell him. He'd long now for an ordinary dream, or even just the empty nothing of his dreamless sleep. Anything to escape the increasing feeling of being undone. With what little focus he could retain, he struggled simply to think of the words, What are you? But just as he did, the notion of that sharp and all-consuming grin manifested in what remained of his mind's eye. Its sharp, toothy, psychic impression, broadening as though growing in size and intensity. As it reached what it felt like critical mass, with the last of Tim's sense of self a basic existence clinging desperately to whatever reality it swam within, it implied a single, unspoken sentiment. Hungry. The word or sentiment rang out like a church bell in Tim's mind. It felt almost to be followed by a deep and hollow laughter, akin to a cackle though not quite as shrill. It shook him to the core of what remained, and in a single last desperate attempt to save himself, Tim imagined closing his eyes, simply wishing for nothing more than to wake up from this terrifying nightmare. And so, he did. Sitting up in bed, Tim felt beads of cold sweat trickle down his face and neck. He sat up, pulling in a sharp and deep breath, desperate for air as though he'd been suffocating. Clinging tendrils of the specifics of his nightmare unwound and disappeared as he tried to think of them, each terrifying moment and memory being wiped away by the waking world with only the terror and general sentiment lingering uncomfortably in his mind. He shook his head and with the white t-shirt he still wore wiped his brow and neck. Slowly, his heart rate decreased until it reached a comfortable norm, and rising from his bed, he looked about his room. Typically, he would leave his phone on the nightstand, but looking to its normal spot, found not only had he failed to place his phone down before bed, but had failed to set its charging cable up as well. Groaning slightly, he began pouring through his still unpacked luggage, as well as the pockets to his jacket, hoping above all else that he hadn't either left it on the plane or in the Uber he'd left the airport from. He recalled having it at the airport prior to departure in, in Peru, so he was certain at least that he hadn't left it behind along with his watch. So it began the irritating process of ripping through every conceivable inch of his apartment, looking in every possible nook and cranny within the hopes of finding his lost phone. Signing into his account on his laptop in the hopes of using the Find My Phone feature, he was doubly annoyed to find not only that he couldn't access the service, but that he was unable to even log into his account at all with the system bouncing it back, stating it had no records of such a login. His first day back, it seemed, was destined now to be a massive hassle, as was the working world in general. 
He sighed and groaned and sighed again, realizing he'd need first to go to the mobile shop and sort it out in person. But then, feeling a slight tinge of relief as he remembered he would not need to return to work until the next day. This at least left him free to attend to his errands and decompress a bit more after such an exotic excursion. As he continued rifling through every possible location for his missing phone, the apartment buzzer sounded, announcing the arrival of a guest. Through the intercom, Tim spoke. Hello? Hey. Amanda said through the speaker. It's me. I hope you're not just getting up now. It's almost one in the afternoon. Come on, let's go get something to eat. Yeah, hold on. Didn't have my alarm. I'll be right down, Tim replied. Slightly more irked that he'd slept so much of the day away. Taking a moment to check one last time, he shrugged, assuming he'd find his phone later. Then grabbing his keys and wallet, slipped out into the hall and took the stairs downwards, joining Amanda at the front door. He was surprised when he arrived to see that Kenny was not with her. But fashioned, he may likely have had work today. Just us today? Tim asked as the door to his building closed behind him. Uh, yeah, unless he had someone you wanted to invite in mind, Amanda replied as the two turned and began walking towards her small red compact car. Um, nah, just... Uh, never mind, I'm pissed. Seems I lost my phone. Amanda looked quizzically at him. Phone? Since when do you have a phone? Um, since, like, always, Tim replied. Seriously? And you never gave the number out? What was it, like a, a secret phone or something? Amanda teased. Tim was utterly baffled. Like most of his generation, he usually hated taking actual phone calls, preferring to text or use some messenger service with the like to keep in touch. This being the case, Amanda had quite notably been his most frequent caller aside from scam calls about the warranty for the car he didn't own. It had irked him for a while, but realizing Amanda was and would forever be a phone call person as opposed to a text person, he had grown to accept it. Amanda, seriously, this isn't funny. First I lost my watch, now my phone. Come on. Seriously, I... Didn't know you had a phone. You've never had a phone. See, Jolly and I have been riding you for years to get one, but you're always like, oh, no, no, I don't want one, or something like that. So now you come out and tell me you had one, and now you lost it? Not cool, dude. Amanda retorted, slightly irritated at the implication, as she was personally a big fan of making in-person phone calls to check in with her friends. Amanda, you call me more than anyone. You call me more than Kenny, Tim exclaimed. Kenny? Who the hell is Kenny? Amanda replied, her confusion deepening. Tim merely stared in bewilderment at his friend as she drove. This had to be some sort of prank. Perhaps his tight band of buddies had decided to mess with him while he slept on his flight. The point of such a jape he could not fathom, but what made the matter all the more confusing and, to a degree, concerning, was how absolutely serious and confused Amanda looked. She was no actress. Tim knew this after seeing her one and only attempt at the craft, made when she was cast in a student film years ago. It just so happened. The film was being made by his best friend, Kenny who quite clearly cast her just so he'd have a chance to talk to her. The chance panned out, the film not so much. Yet here, years later, Amanda sat beside him, convincingly playing as to having no memory of his phone, his watch, or Kenny, his best friend. This had to be some elaborate prank, but the sincerity in Amanda's eyes and confused expression either betrayed this as impossible, or that... She had secretly been taking drama lessons in preparation for this practical joke. 
Kim sat and stared at her in silence. She, eyes wide and eyebrows akimbo, shot equally stunned and baffled glances back at him as she drove. For a moment, both wondered if their Peruvian indulgences weren't somehow affecting their cognitive abilities. Amanda came to a stop at a red light and turned to Tim. Tim, I don't know what game this is or what is going on, but you're starting to weird me out, she said slowly. I'm weirding you out. You're freaking me the fuck out right now, Amanda. You don't know Kenny. You're Kenny. Your boyfriend. My best friend. Tim stammered. My boyfriend? Tim, I don't have a boyfriend. I haven't had a boyfriend in years, Amanda insisted. Her gaze now going from confusion to concern as she began to wonder if her friend hadn't lost his mind somehow. Bullshit! I don't get what kind of game this is, but hey, I've got an idea. Let me see your phone. Tim reached out, as though he was ready to just take it from the center console where she'd placed it. Amanda snatched it up before he could reach it. What? No. Why? Because unless you really, really, I mean really committed to this gag, you'll still have his number on your phone. So come on, let me see. Tim, you're starting to freak me out now. What the fuck is going on with you? Fuck it. Call Dan then. Or CJ, unless they're in on it too. This is pretty fucked up to pull just after we all come back from Spirit Quest drug tourism shit. Amanda's confusion and concern deepened. Tim, who the hell is Dan? It was you, me, and CJ who went down on your birthday trip. You didn't have a phone. You didn't have a watch that I was aware of. Are you feeling okay? Tim took a measure of slow, deep breaths, his eyes never leaving Amanda's, who, was, as far as he could tell, were completely honest as to her bewilderment. Please, can I please see your phone? He asked, remembering that he had texted her the day they took off for Peru, and that unless she had performed a meticulous purge, it should still be there. Fuck it. Fine. Here, she said handing it over to him. It was already unlocked, and Tim began by going into her messages. Sorry for this, he said, observing that it was clearly uncomfortable for her to even have a friend going through her messages. Strangely, he saw nothing from Kenny, and nothing from himself going back weeks and even months. It was as though neither of them had existed as contacts in her phone. But surely she had to have pictures still, Amanda had been mad about taking pictures during their trip and in general. Do you mind if I look through your photos? He asked earnestly. Amanda paused, thinking over her photos. She was a single woman after all, and the chances of an errant lewd photo being somewhere in her picture roll wasn't to be counted out. But she couldn't continue letting her friend labor under whatever strange delusion seemed to have overcome him. And so she nodded, her permission. Tim wasted no time. Flipping through the photos of their trip, he was utterly puzzled. In every photo, including those he remembered specifically being group photos, it was only the three of them. Amanda, CJ, and himself. In image after image, only the three of them appeared, which, once the initial shock had worn down a little, was then compounded when Tim noticed that the photos of what was a larger group trip to a retreat with staff was suddenly barren of all but the three of them. None of this made any sense. Amanda looked clearly concerned and increasingly frightened as Tim's confusion and frustration deepened. What? What happened to them? Where'd they go? Tim said, struggling with every syllable as his mind raced over the various possibilities. Was he dreaming? Was he still tripping? Was this some 
weird side effect of his trip. Could this be some fever dream due to illness or even impending death? The various possibilities were endless and his mind raced over each and every one in what seemed like a mere moment. He turned and looked out the passenger window of the car as it sat at the red light. His head felt like it was a spinning top and as such became a physical sensation, he shook it from side to side, closing his eyes. He opened them a moment later as he felt the car begin to move forward. Looking up, he saw that the light was still red and that the car seemed to be rolling freely forward. Whipping his head around to his left, he called out, Amanda! Yet the driver's seat was empty, as was the hand he had been holding her phone with. The sudden and impossible disappearance of she and her device were only matters Tim was able to consider briefly, as the car, now slowly rolling into the intersection, was soon crashed into on the driver's side, crushing the driver's door well into the seat Amanda had just been sitting in and utterly obliterating the window on that side of the car. The loud bang was then accompanied by a dizzying spin as the small compact car was hurled spinning across the intersection by the larger SUV which had hit it. Tim saw, but could not process the sight of the world turning and flying all about him as chunks of safety glass careened and bounced about the cabin like flakes in a snow globe. It was over in but an instant, but in those moments felt like it took an eternity. Then things went black for a moment. Tim's eyes cracked open and saw at first only blinding light. As the light came into focus, he could make out a clear blue sky hedged first by the tops of trees and buildings, then hedged again by the roundest shapes of human heads who were looking down upon him. Coming further into focus, he could see that upon each head there was a face, and upon each face there was a look of dread concern. The sound of sirens in the distance made him glad for a moment to know that help was coming for whatever poor soul was having a bad enough day to need it. He smiled slightly as his hearing came back to him. Are you all right? A voice shouted down to him. Hey, can you hear me? The sudden hollering seemed excessive and shook him a bit, just enough for him to emerge from the daze and confusion. He had just been in a car accident. Worse than that, it was Amanda's car. She must have been there, but then came back to him. She was gone when the truck hit. How? Had she bailed at some moment when he wasn't looking? He had turned away, but then why? And where did she go? Tim shifted and sat up. A middle-aged woman in scrubs urged him to remain down, but he rose too quickly and was on his feet before she could stop him. His shoulder hurt. So did his neck. But neither were broken, and besides, it didn't matter. He scanned all about in search of Amanda, seeing nothing. Sir, you need to sit down. Help is on the way, the nurse insisted. No, I'm fine. I need to find my friend, he said, looking over a very demolished red compact and nearby a dinged-up SUV with a very annoyed driver standing outside, surveying the damage. As his gaze met Tim's, he began to approach from across the now mostly closed intersection. Hey! You! The squat yet muscular driver shouted. What the fuck, man? Tim turned back to the nurse. My friend, my friend Amanda, she was in the car with me. What happened to her? He asked pleadingly. The nurse simply returned his gaze with one that appeared as confused as Amanda's had been while Tim had checked her phone. Honey, there was no one with you in that car. You were alone, and you were in the passenger seat. Was this for some kind of internet thing? Like a TikTok challenge thing? Because honey, my niece tried one of those, and... Tim cut her off unceremoniously. 
No. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. There was no one there. You're sure? You're sure? He said, almost breathlessly. Yes, I am sure, the nurse replied. Listen, you need to sit down and wait for help to come. You're not okay right now, okay? But it's all right, because I'm a trauma nurse, and I'm here to help you, okay? Tim sighed, which upon inhaling partially hurt. He likely had some form of rib or shoulder fracture or bruising that a nurse would be ideal to see about. However, as he looked upon the street signs, which hung from overhead along the traffic light power lines, he realized that he knew where he was. He was near somewhere familiar to him. He needed that, the familiar. He needed to know he wasn't entirely out of his mind and that enough of the world was still there. He would need to go to work. Thanking the nurse who looked very close to attempting to physically restrain him, Tim set off on something of a hobbling run across the intersection and down the sidewalk in the direction he knew the club he worked at was located. It was but a few easy blocks, and surely the sirens he heard on approach would be far too preoccupied by the actual accident to pursue him. As he ran, he looked over to the angry SUV driver, expecting to see him giving chase. But instead, there was nothing. Neither driver, nor SUV. Ignoring this, he ran onward, sparing a glance backward over his shoulder only after he'd made it roughly a block. What he saw, or rather, what he didn't see, caused him to run even faster, as behind him, there were no sirens, nor busted red car, nor SUV, nor angry driver, nor nurse, nor traffic, nor anything. Quite literally, anything. It was a void. A void which seemed wholly and oddly familiar in its nothingness. Tim stopped dead in his tracks. Whatever ringing in his ears or pain in his head that had been there was now well and gone replaced only by a deep dread. He swore that as he looked into the void, it looked back. Not only did it look back, in fact, but rather, it felt as though it smiled. The void had smiled. Whether it be at him or upon him would remain a mystery, were mysteries ever a thing again. But it smiled all the same. Not knowing what else to do, Tim turned and ran. His legs and muscles came to burn as he sprinted and dashed as fast as he could, away from the invisible, yet fully comprehended maw that sat as and within that darkness. He knew not why, but perhaps it was the original destination he'd had in mind. His legs seemed to carry him from block after block, across intersection after intersection, all in the aim of reaching his club. It had, he remembered, a large steel cooler. Somewhere perhaps he might be safe and able to ride this whole thing out. Yet as his legs carried him forward, the sensation of creeping and domineering darkness behind him felt further and further upon his heels. Soon it felt like each step was one in which only the balls of his feet or his very tiptoes were able to make any kind of contact with any kind of road. He was running out of time, space, and options. Then, as he approached, seeing the location of the nightclub from whence he had made his living, he stopped dead in his tracks. No point in moving forward anymore, I guess, he thought to himself, looking down to see an empty storefront on a barren and desolate Dust Bowl street, where once his place of work and many other thriving businesses had been. It was not that they had been ended and shut down, but rather had simply never been. He knew that now. Yep. End of the line, a voice said to him within his head. It was incorporeal and hard to get a real read on but its intent and message were clear. Can I ask where you are? Tim said aloud, 
Watching as the sky, horizon, trees, and road in the distance all began to shrivel and shrink out of existence as an endless and deep darkness overtook it. I suppose, it said, you and your friends sought a chance to vacation in other worlds, and that is what you got. You, for whatever reason, visited my plane, which is the void, the absence of things. And if you can believe it, you are kind enough to bring me back. Now, I will feast upon your reality. I will gorge myself on your facts until there is nothing left but you. And from there, we shall see. Where are my friends? Tim asked in a vain attempt at defiance. The nothing merely laughed. Your friends. Your friend. You never had any friends, Tim. In fact, you never had a name. And thank you. Your name itself was a rather delicious treat. But now, on to the real business, human thing, it began. He didn't know why, but he knew he was being addressed. He was a creature without a name, and had always been so. A simple observer of a world around him, never once addressed by anyone or anything as anything at all. It had been a remarkably simple life, he thought. The darkness continued. Would you care to be the final thing in your universe to exist? Or would you rather it all just be done with now? You included, it asked. I'm not... The nameless thing once known as Tim began. I'm not sure. How did we get here? We've always been here. You silly little holdover. But if you must know, it isn't wise for corporeals like you to play in realms you know nothing of. You dabble in what you don't understand and then act surprised when it doesn't go well. The darkness chuckled derisively. The thing once known as Tim replied. It was my birthday. As it spoke, the last of its solid memories and consciousness began to lead physically from it. The darkness grunted. No, it wasn't. Never was. <laughs> I didn't imagine you would have been strong enough to hold on this long. I am impressed. But worry not for that which never began can never really end.
tales for dark nights.